In a previous video, we talked about what possibly might be the deadliest car in Formula One history, and the negligence and lack of care surrounding its construction and deployment. It made me think about what is the deadliest street-going vehicle in history. We can think of this stat in a few different ways, with the obvious being that the best-selling cars would be those with the highest fatalities, based on the sheer number of them sold. When the F-Series of trucks accounts for 3.3 million vehicles sold in the last five years, and 10,845 fatal crashes over that five-year span. Also making the list is the Chevy Silverado, Honda Accord, Toyota Camry, Ram pickups, and you can see where this is going. It would be very easy to wrap this video and say that the F-Series is the most deadly and call it a day. But Ford designs their modern vehicles for safety, with stringent regulations in place set by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. But those guidelines weren't always as strict, and the vehicle that we're going to be talking about today is one of the worst examples of flagrant disregard for human life that I've ever seen in a mass-produced vehicle. Meet the Pinto. Just born. Ford's Pinto is priced like a small economy import, but it's frisky, with a wider stance than any little import so you won't be pushed around by the wind. And Pinto's strong, built to run and run and run. Pinto, a little better idea at your Ford dealer. As far as cars that are remembered horribly, the Ford Pinto holds the honor of being among the worst offenders. Chances are you've heard of the Pinto, and not for good reason. In the 1960s, American automakers were sticking to what they did best. Big, powerful, fuel-guzzling cars, while at the same time, small fuel-efficient imports were gaining favor of the consumer masses as cheaper and easier to live with vehicles than what the American manufacturers were offering. With nothing to offer in the way of a small economical car, the American consumer was left with no alternative to trying an import brand. Lee Lacocca, famous for overseeing the creation of the Mustang and reviving Chrysler, among other things, was vice president of Ford North America in the 1960s and saw the market changing and pleaded with then Ford president Seaman Knudsen that Ford needed a car that could compete with the economically friendly imports. Knudsen initially dismissed the claims, arguing that Ford should stick to developing the successful medium and large cars they were known for. Eventually, due to the market onslaught that Lacocca predicted Ford would encounter from Japanese and European automakers, the Ford Motor Company began work on the Pinto in 1967, and a basic design concept was completed and approved by Ford Product Planning by December of 1968. Automakers to this day typically operate on a 3-5 to five year cycle from initial design to showroom floor. And that is what Ford planned to do with the Pinto, having it ready somewhere between the 1972 and 74 model years for production. Lococa, once again fearing how far Ford was behind in the compact car marketplace, pushed for the typical cycle to be thrown out the window and condensed that process to just 25 months, having it ready for the 1971 model year. Lococa also insisted that the new model weigh in at no more than 2,000 pounds and cost no more than $2,000, standards that were considered by engineers to be set in stone. With such an aggressive development cycle, Ford engineers had to take on unconventional and out-of-the-box thinking. Tooling for the production of the Pinto was taking place as the design was being finalized, and early crash test prototypes were derived from the already-in-production Ford Maverick. These aggressive changes meant that any unexpected design flaws or safety standard issues would be almost impossible to fix without retooling or at the very least additional cost that would not be economical for the Pinto's production. Ford predicted that new NHTSA safety regulations would be in place in 1973. So to prepare themselves for the change, they put the Pinto through far more thorough crash testing than ever before. Ford's Maverick prototypes were put through crash testing, and for the front and side impact crashes, they were typical and expected. But Ford discovered a major fault with rear-end collisions. The early crash tests showed that in 11 rear-end collision tests conducted at 31 miles per hour, the Pinto leaked fuel in eight separate accidents. In the three remaining tests where the Pinto's fuel tank didn't leak, engineers had made modifications to the basic design, incorporating a plastic shield to protect the tank, a steel plate between the bumper and tank, and a rubber bladder inside of the fuel tank. While this design change completely prevented the fuel tank ruptures, retooling the line to incorporate these safety changes would have been expensive and time-consuming, which would have pushed the 24-month deadline back considerably. To Ford's delight, the new NHTSA rules they predicted would be in place by 1973 were delayed to 1977. The Ford Pinto launched in 1970, with each and every Pinto produced having been made with full knowledge of the risks its fuel tank carried. 
The Ford Pinto's main objective was described as size, cost of ownership, and clear product superiority, which referred to things such as comfort and appearance, but not safety. An anonymous Ford engineer later told Mother Jones Magazine that the only people at Ford who cared about safety at that time were mostly engineers who had to study a lot of accident reports and look at pictures of burned people. He said Ford ignored safety because it cost time and money, but also because they were afraid discussion about safety would only cause the car buying public to worry, and a Lacoca safety didn't sell cars. Ford's reprehensible actions first came to light in a high-profile accident in May 1972, when a Pinto carrying Lily Gray and her 13-year-old neighbor, Richard Grimshaw, was struck from behind on a California highway at roughly 30 miles an hour. Gray's Pinto and its fuel tank immediately erupted, killing Gray and leaving her 13-year-old neighbor, Richard, with third-degree burns across 90% of his body. Grimshaw was able to survive his injuries but required over 60 surgeries, and in August 1977, seven years after the Pinto's launch, Grimshaw's family went to trial against the Ford Motor Company for the devastating impact the crash had had on Richard's life. During Grimshaw's trial, Ford's behavior was brought to light, and on account of Ford's willful ignorance of the faulty fuel tanks, the court awarded Grimshaw $2.5 million in damages and imposed a $125 million fine to make sure Ford wouldn't design cars that way again. Unfortunately, this fine would eventually be reduced to $3.5 million, just a tiny fraction of the initial penalty imposed on the automaker. After the court case, Ford issued a voluntary recall for the 71 to 76 model year Pintos, retrofitting them with longer fuel tank filler necks and a plastic shield that prevented the fuel tank from the differential bolts. Voluntary recalls are a preemptive strike to limit a manufacturer's liability. So while Ford never admitted any wrongdoing, it was clear from this action and a pending NHTSA hearing that a mandatory recall would have been eventually issued. Richard Grimshaw would not be the only high-profile case, as just six months after the Grimshaw verdict and two months after the voluntary recall, in August 1978, three young girls were returning from a church event when a drunk driver in a full-sized van struck their Pinto from behind, causing the fuel tank to rupture, resulting in the entrapment and death of 16-year-old Lynn Ulrich, 18-year-olds Donna and Judy Ulrich as well. Ford was later tried for reckless homicide in Indiana, Maddie Ulrich, whose two daughters and niece had died in the crash, testified that she did not receive the letter recalling her 1973 car until February 1979, six months after the crash, and that she would have gotten rid of the car had she received the warning before the accident occurred. Indiana State Police Trooper Neil B. Graves testified about his investigation, telling the courtroom of a gaping hole in the Pinto's fuel tank where it had split on impact. Ultimately, Ford avoided reckless homicide charges by a not guilty vote, with the judge stating that Ford had avoided recklessness in conduct by issuing a recall. There are a lot of misconceptions about the Ford Pinto, namely that it was the most deadly car on the road. Mark Dowie won a Pulitzer Prize for Mother Jones article called Pinto Madness, where he stated that by conservative estimates, Pinto crashes have caused 500 burn deaths to people who would not have been seriously injured if the car had not burst into flames, and that figure could be as high as 900. 60 Minutes would also run a piece claiming estimates of 2,000 deaths and 10,000 injuries related to Pinto fires. These events and a report from Ford entitled Fatalities Associated with Crash-Induced Fuel Leakage and Fires that Dowie included in his piece led to claims that the Pinto was by far the most deadly vehicle on the road. When scrutinized, this data falls apart. Firstly, the report produced by Ford was in response to the changing safety laws that coincidentally would have prevented the deaths in the first place, but were designed and applied for all Ford vehicles for those involved in fuel leakages due to rollovers, not rear-end collisions. While telling about the value of a life by Ford executives, it was not an omission of any guilt regarding the Pinto fires or lawsuits. The other incredibly telling piece of data is from the NHTSA itself. The fatality rate per million vehicles for 1975 and 76 showed that the Pinto was responsible for 298 deaths per million vehicles, putting it on par with the Chevy Vega and Datsun 510, and considerably safer than the Datsun 1200, Toyota Corolla, and VW Beetle. And in 1976, it shows the Pinto's 322 deaths per million just slightly higher than two of its rivals. While most of these deaths can be attributed to the general poor safety standards of the time, only 27 Pinto deaths are associated with fires. Later internal Ford documents would make it publicly known that Ford could have fixed the issue on every Pinto for $11 per car, but that it would have cut into profits too much, though this in itself was later revealed as a lie 
as Ford had presented flawed data and bad math to hide even cheaper options to fix the Pinto. The Pinto case is a staple in engineering ethics courses as an example of a bad cost-benefit analysis. So while Henry Ford II and his resentment of the government and his company's bottom line caused the needless deaths of at least 27 people, the Pinto was no more dangerous than its market rivals. Which I think says more about how lackadaisical car manufacturers were at the time about safety standards than any singular car or cause of accident. While doing the research for this video, I was actually shocked to find out that the Pinto was not the complete death trap that I had always been led to believe that it was. Let me know in the comments below if you also believe the Pinto story, and don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel for more future videos.